I hope everyone can understand me. Um, perfect. So I would say we start. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you finally um, online. But um, yeah, very warm welcome to everyone to today's panel and maybe some uh, technical information as we already discussed. Uh, so you have the little globe icon where you can uh, click your interpretation if you want to hear German or English. And then also you have a little button um, for uh, for your questions from the audience. Uh, so audience, hello. <laughs> if you have any questions, just click on the button. Um, I think this could be very interesting to hear your questions too. So um, I will switch to German quickly. Um, liebes Publikum, Sie können auch gerne die Übersetzung... Dear audience, you may as well listen to the translation in German or English. Please click the little globe. I come back, back to English now. We so, are uh, bilingual here today. I'm very happy to uh, moderate this panel today about visionary institutions for crisis prevention within our Berlin Demography Days 2024. And so my name is Noemi Trompeter and I'm in charge of the moderation today. And um, I'm not alone. As you can see, uh, we have four uh, experts with us today and I will quickly present you. So I take the order of the program. I hope it's fine for you. I think it's the alphabet uh, from, the, uh, from the first names. So I, I start with uh, Professor Einstein Asave. You are um, a professor for demography from Bocconi University in Milan and also head of futures towards a resilient future of, of Europe which is a Horizon Europe collaborative project, as I read. Um, thank you for being here today. And um, I also read that one of your latest research interests was how one can enhance resilience through policy design, which is very interesting for today's question and the topic. Um, then we have with us uh, Bernard O. Onyango, Welcome to you as well. You're a senior research and policy analyst from the African Institute for Development Policy and the Population Environment and Development PED Director of the USAID-funded BUILD project. That's what I read on your website. And it's very interesting and fitting in today's panel, of course. And um, then we have Daniel Mucha. He is uh, concerned with crisis management at the German Federal Ministry of the Interior and Community. And uh, as you told me, you're also a police director and you can perfectly bring your experience from this field into your work at uh, the ministry uh, in Germany. And we also have Florence Bauer. Uh, welcome to you as well. You are a regional director for Eastern Europe and Central Asia at the United States. United Nations Population Fund. And um, yeah, as I read uh, for you as well, you were, um, has, you had been uh, always a strong advocate for positioning children's and women's rights. Um, and uh, yeah, very interesting uh, and very interesting experts that I can welcome today. So thank you for joining this afternoon. And before we start the discussion, I will just briefly uh, tell our audience the, the agenda. So uh, I will just give a little introduction to the topic. I want you to talk, of course, you're the experts, but just a little one so everyone knows uh, what we are talking about. And then, um, yeah, for our first question, I would like you to present your um, yeah your standing to the topic, your um, your point of view, so everyone knows uh, what you stand for here in this panel, and then we would go into the discussion whether if there are questions from the audience and also for um, for your um, experts. So um, what I was wondering is um, if we have yeah the question about visionary uh, institutions. I was wondering about how can we now the institutions that we have improve and also build trust for them, because I think this is uh, yeah sometimes a problem uh, in the past, for example. And so the aim of the session is that everyone from the audience has a takeaway and gets an idea about visionary institutions for crisis prevention. So, um, yeah, regarding the topic. Um, 
I think that, uh, yeah, if we, as I said, if we have a look on the past uh, crisis, there were different ways to handle different situations, such as the pandemic, of course. And there are also different ways how to turn these institutions which deal with crises uh, into re resilient uh, institutions. And this is what we try to look at closer today. So we have experts giving us interesting and best practice responses to crisis. And uh, yeah, I would say um, we directly start with your experiences. I think everyone is very interested. So uh, maybe I will repeat like, the little initial question that I suggest, of course, you can um, also yeah, give other questions to us. So my question would be, how can we institutionally improve and maybe also society, socially anchor crisis management or in this case, prevention? And to, um, yeah, to give this panel um, a, a good start, I would like to... Uh, Every one of the experts uh, maybe bring their key words or key phrases, uh, key thoughts uh, on the topic. Um, how can we build resilient institutions? And um, we can all, we can uh, see it like this: that uh, we stay in within this order, uh, as we only have one female expert today. I would suggest maybe Florence, you would like to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and a special greetings to the other panelists. So thank you for the question. Um, I think the first consideration is that what do we really mean by crisis? Because of course we can be thinking of the most extreme crisis, the kind of unpredictable big bang that would happen and it would be of course much more difficult to, um, to prepare for. But then we can classify, I would say, crisis um, in two groups of crisis. So the ones that are very, to some extent, predictable, or we know that they can, or, or, or the, they can happen. We know that they can happen, like an earthquake, like a tsunami, like a big drought, or a kind of pollution, or this kind of crisis. That, of course, have tremendous humanitarian implication, and that uh, will happen in a very sudden way. And those kind of crises, of course, would require a kind of uh, investment in preparedness and response so that institutions are able to, uh, to deal with it. But then we have a second category of crises. That's what I will be focusing on. Those are the crises that unfold uh, in a slower manner. Um, that at any point of time, they are not so uh, serious, maybe. But those are the crises where if we do not do anything, they will have tremendous implications on, uh, on the population and, uh, and on humankind. And of course, I would be referring uh, to climate change, but also to demography, to the so-called demographic crisis. When we look back uh, from a demographic point of view, we can see that um, demograph demographic trends are actually predictable. So already decades ago, we knew that some population would continue to grow to some extent, but that progressively it would be aging and that progressively we would have some countries that are actually facing even a decline in population. But despite the predictability of demographic trends, there has been always a way to look at it as if it is something absolutely sudden and unpredictable. And that's often this even the terminology that is used to refer to it as a bomb. And uh, in previous centuries, in the 19th century, um, the bomb was actually the growth, the population growth of the growth of the population was seen as a very, as a threatening population. And it is still seen like this to some extent. But now in more recent years, more recent decades, the new bomb, let's say to some extent, is actually the population aging. And, and again, when we look back, this is not a surprise. We knew that this is, would be happening. And uh, but we so the tendency, let's say, in countries have been to really consider it and try to find responses once it has a stronger impact uh, on social protection system, on health system, on labor market, and so on. So in order to be able to address this kind of crisis, um, it requires a much more comprehensive kind of response. And the issue and the challenge here is that the quick fixes that are often the ones that will be prioritized uh, in countries, uh, they don't really solve the issue. So the response needs to be long-term because demographic doesn't 
as we say, doesn't change overnight. And the response to this kind of situation needs to have a long-term approach. They need to be um, comprehensive and cross-sectoral. For example, having the health system, social protection system, education system, labor system, and so on, working together. And it requires an investment in inclusive societies, including gender equality, gender empowerment. And of course, this kind of approach is much more difficult, in particular when we are thinking of election period and, and the period between two governments that is very short to some extent, it is much more difficult to be able um, to have this kind of response. Now, the good news um, that, I, that I'm happy to share here is that as UNFPA, we see in our region, in particular in Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia and many other countries as well, there is a growing interest in uh, countries, government and other stakeholders are actually asking our support to help them to be able to respond in a more comprehensive, in a more holistic way to this kind of, of, uh, of situation. So since you're interested as well to know in, in practical terms um, what, we are, what we are recommending, we developed, as you know, together with our partner, what we call our demographic resilience program, um, and it has four main pillars. So very um, shortly, uh, in a few words, the first one is to strengthen what I would call the science politics policy interface. So it's to help governments, to help countries to be able to predict the demographic trends, to have the data that they need, and to use this evidence to input into the policies. And we develop, for example, population policy labs that we have in, in some places. Um, then the second pillar is to help um, the countries, the governments and other stakeholders to be able to respond to those demographic trends. So it means having social system in place, having education system in place, health system, infrastructure and so on that would be able to respond to these new demographic challenges and uh, taking into account those demographic trends. The third one is um, really helping, again, the countries to um, invest in inclusive societies. What we can see, for example, in many countries is that there is a tremendous opportunity by tapping into uh, more gender equality, empowerment of gender, giving more access to women to the labor market, to minorities, to aging population, ensuring that they have a healthy aging and that they can continue to contribute to society. So the inclusiveness is a very key pillar as well. And finally, the last, the fourth pillar is to um, work also uh, again with, with stakeholders to um, influence the public discourse because there is this tendency of looking into, um, of having, adopting a very anxiety driven kind of approach and using what seems to be quick and easy fixes is actually often counterproductive in this area. So there is a requirement to work with the government, with society as one influencing the population, and uh, so that it is understood that the anxiety is actually not a good counselor when we're talking about policies and to really adopt a more comprehensive kind of approach. So those are some of the elements that I would like to bring here in the first round. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it was very well structured and uh, helped a lot for the start to uh, to get a, a very good idea. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned before, I think it would be nice that every one of the experts um, mm -hmm. says mm -hmm. something in this first round. Um, I would suggest that we uh, just go on from the alphabet then. <laughs> So next would be uh, Professor Azave. So um, yeah, what uh, are your thoughts? Maybe also on what Ms. Bauer said, but initially, um, yeah, your take. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for uh, having me on this uh, panel. Uh, I, no, I would like to start by uh, uh, acknowledging uh, the the uh, points that uh, Florence is is uh, making here. Uh, it's it's very interesting to to see that these uh, a lot of the things we see in terms of demographic change, aging in particular, is very easy to predict. Uh, I mean that we have projections. It's pretty clear what, where it's going and so on. And uh, and yet it comes across as for many a bit of a, 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 a surprise, so to speak. Now, one reason uh, this is happening is that uh, we are talking about 
visionary institutions here and 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 but one reason it's happening is that a lot of the institutions that are have to ne necessarily have to deal with these issues they are very rigid and they are very cemented in their way of operating and uh, so ha having started or gone through uh, a somewhat of a stable period and there has been a certain view on where where we are heading and how institutions should operate uh, we are starting to um, uh, uh, experience that we are i mean we are finding ourselves in a little bit uncharted territory and and one one thing there that i would like to put on the table here is um uh, technological change uh digitalization uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh for many this is coming uh, across as a shock uh, uh robots replacing uh, uh humans uh, in the workforce so there's a lot of change going on and and it seems that it's happening faster than than what has been in recent years and, and yet uh, the institutions, many of the institutions are, are finding it difficult to uh, keep up. Now, but I wanted to take one step back here. And, and one, of the, one thing I think is important in, in this debate, it is to um, try to think about resilience on one hand and robustness on the other hand. Uh, they are not the same thing. They are related, but they are not the same thing. And when we think about robustness, that is, that sort of leads to the idea of preparation. So how can we prepare for shocks? How can we uh, try to avoid shocks by may taking the right, uh, right actions? So that's an important part. Uh, but resilience is a little bit different because that's, that's kind of saying, how do we adapt once the shock happens nevertheless? And, and I, I guess what we can uh, safely say from from recent <laughs> recent times is that we certainly did have a few shocks that and uh, or let's say crises that were truly shocks. They were really unexpected, and we were not really in any position to predict it. And you know, I'm think of course uh, uh, talking about the pandemic, uh, then uh, the the in inflation, uh, the war in Ukraine, and 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 now even more recently, the Middle East crisis. So there are these kind of things that have happened um, uh, very suddenly. And, and I think what is important here is on one hand for the robustness, you want to do the job in terms of diplomacy in order to deal with geopolitical challenges. Uh, you want to have uh, sort of crisis plans in place if there is another pandemic and so on. But yet at the same time, for resilience, you need to have institutions helping individuals to be resilient if if the uh, the shock happens nevertheless. So there are there are kind of two different dimensions. And I think for, for policymakers and 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 institutions is important to be, uh, aware that they they operate in, in in a different way, and and the way from the kind of uh, research that we've done, uh, for instance, one of the things that appears to be uh, incredibly important for individual resilience, that is education. So education, the, the higher the education, um, the, the the better people are prepared to deal with whatever shock comes their way. So, and, and yet at the, at the same time, the, the, the other kind of key finding that we have is that when we measure individuals' resilience, they are not perfect measures, but if you do that and you try to aggregate it up to the country or nation state levels, and you try to correlate that with any kind of uh, measure of resilience you have at the country level, you see that they are correlated. And that is that is to say that um, uh, resilient people make up resilient institutions and, and, and vice versa. So one important policy that one needs to think about in terms of improving or helping uh, citizens' uh, resilience is really to be fo focused very strongly on education. And, and I would say more than what has been done up until now. 
Um, so th that's kind of my starting point in terms of entering this uh, this conversation. Great, thank you so much. Um, very interesting your point of view as well. And um, I would say uh, we go on with uh, Mr. Onyango. Do you agree maybe on what was said by Professor Aswe or what are your, is your take, your buzzword or phrase on the topic? Yes. So uh, th th thanks very much for inviting me for this. And uh, I really want to, I think, uh, listening to the first two speakers, Florence and uh, uh, Professor Sal. Um, I, I really agree with them, uh, but from, from my point of view and from uh, the work we do, uh, I work for an institution um, based in, headquartered in Malawi, that uh, we, uh, most of our work is in sub-Saharan Africa, working around population and development and uh, health and well-being and other uh, development uh, aspects. And for me, I think a key uh, component that you know we 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 have to emphasize is uh, the, the the knowledge management, and that comes from you know one for all the way from generating uh, uh, the knowledge to translation. And, and communication being very key. Um, and uh, I, I think that you know that if if institutions can can do this, invest in knowledge management better and institutions, including within you know the government, uh, then uh, a decision making uh, at various levels would be uh, more effective. And Partly also because I think the, the, the really importance here um, when you talk about the translation and uh, uh, the earlier speaker um, uh, from UNFPA uh, talked about how in you know demographers uh, we've been able to you know model all these population projections we we know for example uh, roughly how many people we are going to have in another in another twenty thirty years. Uh, um, but somehow we are not. We end up not 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 planning very well, and and you know we get to situations where we 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 have crisis, and so I think that it, it, we need to be able to the the importance for translating knowledge for different audiences is so that uh, we can be on the same page. I think a lot of the work that researchers are doing uh, doing great work but it's not getting out there whether it's to the policy makers but also just to you know the general public to 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 understand the issues and uh, uh if you look at the the uh, the issue around the climate crisis for example um and and at climate change skeptics uh a lot of uh, what is out there that uh, you know that's increasing uh, skeptics is because the information uh you know we we have some Good evidence, but probably not not well packaged for 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 the different audiences. But at the same time, uh, it, it we are at a point in time in history when we have to be very proactive about messaging, putting out a message uh, very clearly. So, um, and as researchers, you know, it shouldn't just yes, there is the importance of doing your. Your, your publications, but those end up in 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 research, uh, in in journals that are are not being accessed by people, and so we we see a lot of these uh, challenges. Um, I wanted to talk about the issue of context, and when we 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 talk about the the the, the you know crisis, yes, there are issues that uh, cut across the globe, but even despite the issues cutting across the globe, you still find that. Uh, you know, from region to region, and even within within country, context is is very uh, important. And so, uh, in 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 countries with less resources to 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 generate evidence, for example, uh, you look at uh, 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 what we do, um, the, the the surveys that are done. For example, I know in Europe, for example, you don't uh, most countries in Europe. Of these population registers and the civil registration is very strong. This is not the case in, say, African countries where uh, they rely on uh, the census 
uh, population such as being done in some in in the countries doing well every ten years. Um, in some countries, it hasn't been done for a very long time. So it it ends up being a, a challenge for uh, for 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 planning. But I want uh, again when when you are talking about context. Uh, and making sure you know what's what's the message that's that's getting out there. And I've had my colleagues, um, you know, based in Europe, they've they've already talked today eloquently about aging. And the issue about population aging, if if, if it's a reality, it's going to 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 happen as well in 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 Africa. But it's not. Um, if you look at it in terms of the, the the population challenge, it's not it's not the priority right now. But for example, in our work, when we when we work, uh, you know, with the policymakers, uh, for in countries where you know fertility rates are still quite quite high, women having you know five plus children and and population growing quite rapidly, when um. You, you talk to the the some of the key decision makers about the the, the need to uh, address the challenge you know the, the, the people are not having access to information on voluntary family planning people are not having uh, access to services and they say no but what why why should that be a priority while you know uh, population aging is hurting uh, europe and uh, uh, asia and and so um, just being able to 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 again package the evidence and communicate why it's important, why context is also you know very 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 critical. Um, the other issue, for example, uh, uh, a couple of years ago when we 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 had the 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 uh, uh, COVID pandemic, as we know, it affected different uh, uh, regions differently, right? But uh, I mean with the Given that it was a crisis, I think in in the midst of crisis, uh, you know, decisions were made, and for example, um, many countries in the region in 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 Africa that ended up, uh, really buying or or procuring uh, a lot of vaccines, which they one they didn't have uh the 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 capacity to to actually fully uh, reach to the people. But even beyond that, I know that uh, uh, for many countries, the, 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 a lot of it were uh, remained and, 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 and expired without being used. So the, I think it's very important uh, that uh, we really, you know, the, this issue around uh, knowledge management, uh, Again, uh, the, the, for the first speaker, yes, I say I know they say demographers, uh, you know, do the the, the projections, uh, the modeling. I think some of that capacity to do that kind of work is still limited in some parts of parts of the world. So, uh, the, the doing the the simulations and, and and modeling scenarios for the future, and not just at national level, but really. Uh, getting down to 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 some national level so that you are able to address the different uh, uh, contexts uh, internally. So um, I guess I, I'll I'll stop there for now and uh, and pick up the conversation as we go along. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words, of course. And I think you uh, last mentioned a, a um, yeah, very interesting point, like the, the knowledge management on a national and international level. And I think that's a very good transition to our next expert, Daniel Mocha. Um, welcome to you again. And um, because you are speaking from uh, the national perspective, the German... Daniel Mocha, Sie sprechen ja aus der... Yeah, vielen Dank, dass ich hier Thank you for having me. Of course, I have a more focused view on the national situation in my role as crisis manager at the national level. So in our team, uh, it is mainly about uh, spatial and timely um, limited crises, which are also manageable in a very short period. Mr. Asher mentioned uh, strongly cemented structures and my view rather is focused on crisis management structures in the ministries 
So those uh, levels where political decisions are taken, that is totally different than at the working level at the bottom, where you really provide assistance. Sometimes is um, the main issue is to collect information, to bundle information, to make the political decision makers, um, um, to enable them to act. So the question which you were asking is really exciting because every day, I have to deal with that question against the background of a relatively complex political structure in Germany. I think you all may guess what I mean, a federal structure, but also the structure of the um, responsibilities at different levels, which uh, very rigidly insist in keeping their um, competencies, etc. Uh, and that makes it very difficult um, in times of a crisis, which rarely is oriented alongside the uh, responsibilities, but rather uh, across those uh, sections. And in the past, those crises have become more complex, whereas, however, responsibilities can ha hardly be um, attributed to regional um, responsibilities or to different levels. And they do not even stop at national borders, let alone distinguishing any crisis between a peaceful uh, peace uh, crisis and the war crisis, uh, so the hybrid threat. So where does the focus shift to in a crisis? And at the ministry uh, level, we try to come up with concepts and structures which break up this uh, rigid um, cementing by a kind of a breathing system, which, uh, which allows for uh, something which is not so easy in Germany, also against the background of our federal structure, which allows to channel and to bundle all available information and um, also to bundle the capacities which are widespread in Germany and well developed at um, local levels, but uh, we need them to enable to cooperate in a situation of crisis. For us, it's also a very exciting experience from the past that reactive um, call structures, which we had also in the past, and again, I'm speaking about the rigidity of the work of institutions. And from our point of view, that was not, um, um, successful in the past. I mean, uh, we have to have this kind of cold start ability or capability. That means that we have to get away from starting to spring into action when a crisis started. You mentioned earlier that you have to realize when a um, crisis is coming up or even when it ends. So we have to also um, to make to grow um, our crisis management before it's even um, perceived by everybody. So cold start um, capability means that we have to establish permanent structures of analyzing the situation, of uh, also overlaying um, different analyses of information that um, AI may also come in in, this, um, co in that consideration. And also when it comes to analysis of experts of different um, levels of uh, situation, which in the good, if everything works smoothly, we can already for, um, predict a certain development of the situation. And that is something which uh, would really um, be a, an important step forward. Crisis management also requires a high level of um, cooperation across um, states and across countries, especially in times of multiple crises, a crisis situation has to be analyzed um, in an exchange of relationships and has to be considered as a, a general phenomenon which requires interdisciplinary action at all levels. And as you have just mentioned it, for us it's also important to test those structures and to see how they work. Also against the background of demographic change, we have to um, look at how we um, transfer the knowledge about a crisis. That's a very important element because the new generation again and again needs uh, to learn from the experience of the older generation. And that's uh, what we see also in our training courses of crisis managers. Um, 
and um, or, uh, we also are over, overseeing a school for crisis management and we hear again and again that experience gets lost if it's not passed on to the next generation, especially this should be also thought of when it comes uh, in the light of this demographic um, change and aging societies. The other question is how do we handle the solutions of crisis? We might think of how to manage a certain crisis, for instance, uh, calculations of time and space for evacuations. That could be one sample, one example. You have to include um, demography in these um, calculations, but also the influence of technical development uh, to what extent we can really reach out to the population in uh, terms of crisis with our technical means and then uh, self um, management and uh, something in which in Germany is very clearly structured is civil commitment, voluntary uh, commitment in managing uh, crisis situations, the Technical Technische Hilfswerk, the technical um, assistance organization or associations and other associations can be mentioned. And of course, it's important to look at the experience of other countries which might, which have a similar structure like Germany, but also the experience of science. How can they support our efforts? That shall do for the moment from my side. Thank you very much, vielen Dank, um, for your <laughs> words and your thoughts on this topic. Uh, I think uh, it was a perfect uh, addition as well uh, to uh, the other experts. And um, I guess, and I hope that the audience now has a good overview about the different positions and inputs. So my question to you would be very simple. <laughs> so do you want to react on something that one of the other panelists said? Uh, you can raise your hand now. Um, I see some some heads, but no hands. Okay, Mr. Onyango, you raised your hand first, I think. So maybe you can react to some of the other panelists. Yes. Uh... And it touches on, on, on uh, I think at least two of this, two, two of the other speakers have, have talked about, uh, you know, the the cross sectoral nature. As we are, we are thinking about uh, development, um, and we are thinking about, uh, you know, looking forward to the twenty thirty uh, SDGs. As we know, we are we are well behind on 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 a lot of those those targets. Uh, part of the, 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 the I think the, the 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 challenge that we have to address uh, on crisis is this cross sectoral collaboration towards results. Um, there is a general agreement that uh, you know we we have to work across the sectors. We have to work together. We have to really apply systems thinking. Think about, for example, uh, climate change and the different sectors it, 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 it's, it's touching upon. So um, one thing you see clearly um, uh, in, in the decision making sort of structures um, across the world, most of the countries have uh, climate change probably as a mandate under the Ministry of Environment, or you know, some Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, or something in that, along those lines. But it does affect different uh, sectors, um, and so for me, for example, I look at work on climate change and health. And it's clear that people in the in the health sector, though there there are real real implications uh, of climate change on health, they're not really having a, a seat at the table of decision making on on the climate uh, change action discourses. And so, how do we actually break those? I think there is a general agreement that we are still working in silos, and uh, uh, but very challenging to actually break those silos and work to, uh, together towards uh, common results. So that, that is something that, you know, should really be a priority. How does this actually work? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's already um, 
not a first maybe, but uh, a learning that I take away from this panel, a very practical example. So I noted that the next person who raised their hand was uh, Ms. Bauer. So... Thank you. Thank you so much for all the interventions and uh, I have to react on, on several of them. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, the one on knowledge management that Mr. Nyango was bringing, I think that's a fundamental one. It's really important that we work together, uh, joint governments, uh, think tanks, university academia, and so on, to, um, to generate the data and make sure that we have the evidence. Because as we were saying, demographic trends are predictable, but there's so many analyses that can be added, actually, so that they really help countries to understand about the population movement as well and how they're going to evolve. And in that respect, the exchange of, uh, of experience between countries is something that we also need uh, to, uh, to favor and to, to facilitate. So, and, and I'm saying this also because we're actually planning, we had a demographic resilience conference in uh, two, years, uh, two years ago now, and we're planning to have one uh, most probably in Portugal towards the end of this year. And that's also a moment where we want to facilitate this kind of knowledge management and exchange. Um, the other point that um, Mr. Mucha was bringing about communication, I know that I understand that it was more in the context of those crises that are limited in time, but I think it applies so much on any kind of crisis. Um, at the same time, we know we have all received so much information, but to make it in a way that it's uh, it doesn't generate anxiety, that it's constructive, and that it really helps people, institution uh, to react and to adapt and to be resilient to the new circumstances. I think that's another challenge that is absolutely fundamental, in particular in this period, as we all know, we are overwhelmed with so many information, very, um, very polarized and with very um, difficult to get balanced views. So our role in terms of uh, facilitating a narrative that is evidence-based and constructive is fundamental. And my third point is what uh, Professor um, Asfe from Bocconi was saying, the importance of education. And, um, and I think that's touching another fundamental aspect. As we know, we still have a number of challenges for uh, young people have access to education. I'm talking to different level of education so that uh, they can then contribute to the institution with this resilient way. It's another fundamental aspect that I would absolutely share. So thank you so much. I stop here for now. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, your words and uh, the reaction. Um, it's very uh, nice to hear that all of you have uh, reactions to each other. Uh, I think uh, it's a very nice discussion. So I think the next hand that I saw was from Professor Aswe. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think these are the knowledge management, knowledge uh, communication is uh, enormous enormous challenge um in the sense that one one thing is to have the communication between policymakers and scientists uh that that's that's one thing and and in in the project that we are running we are really trying to make a lot of effort to have this policy lab where the communication goes both ways scientists learn from what kind of concerns the policymakers and any other stakeholders have and then try to respond to that through our scientific uh, expertise. And uh, that's one effort. But the I think that the, the major challenge is really to have the communication go all the way down to people who 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 live their lives. And 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 again, uh, it's it's very of course important that uh uh Bernard is is here because. One thing is to sort of think about how this is done in, in Europe and the US and so on, but but to really being able to make that kind of communication all the way down in many, many situations where people are, uh, what, what the, the main concern is, is actually uh, survival. Think about the cyclone that hit uh, Malawi and how they are coping and, and, and how, 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 do, how can you then help these people to uh, think about being resilient and so on. I think that's a huge, huge challenge and very uh, urgent, uh, I have to say. And 
And just another co comment, I, I mean, very, very interesting and very, very uh, interesting to hear the, the the work that Daniel is doing and the and the experience. And I think this is a, a case to follow for all countries that there needs to be this kind of uh, very focused crisis management team where there is training and, and, and really there is built up expertise to do it because this goes both in terms of being prepared, but also to enhance uh, resilience. But yet again, I, I would want to make a, a, a case for for the different layers of, of, of when we think about resilience and crisis management. Because you know, one thing to, is to think about the crisis management at the nation level or a community, but but individuals, families, they also face crises they could lose their job or their crop is being destroyed um you know these are these these are uh, micro micro shocks micro crises and 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 that's where i think it is uh, perhaps a bit more new thinking necessary and not only to think uh, uh you know more education for everybody uh, uh, clearly the, the 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 bigger proportion of the population who has knowledge and, and 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 skills that that that's important but i think we also need to think about how uh we we do the education and what what do we need to include in the educational systems and i think that that's very important and then finally moving back to to let's say western countries with, where aging is is really uh pervasive and, and coming uh and holding that up to, get, to with the technological change uh, I think the educational system needs to be sort of reinvented somehow, you know, you know because if you lose your job uh, and you are you're in the 50s, uh, well, what do you do? Uh, how can you help that person to be resilient and, and bounce back and, and, and recover? Well, you know, better access to education, not only to those who are in their teenage years, but even for those who are in uh, middle age or even old people. Uh, so, so there are many, uh, many things one can do there in order to help resilience. But here, I think, you know, still institutions are a little bit too rigid and one needs to work with them in order to improve on those things. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your words. Um, so I also saw the hand of uh, Mr. Moha. So you have the word now. And maybe uh, with a little um, look on uh, the time, um, you have the word now. And maybe afterwards, uh, as we will just have a few minutes, we will make like a last round for your final words, your maybe personal summary of the, of the panel. So just, you know, yeah. already. Um, and yeah, Mr. Moha, um, you can speak now. Yeah. Well, I will try to be very brief, but I would like to answer also Mr. Um, um, Onyango. Uh, there were three elements which I would like to relate to. You mentioned silo thinking. That's a term which we all know very well here as well. And we all regularly try to break out of those silos. And we started a, a training, um, uh, which a training exercise, which uh, uh, fits very well to what you said. The next crisis uh, exercise will take place in 2026 in a big um, level. In between, we have smaller packages of training and we will deal with the subjects of drought, uh, lack of water, fire in the woods. You may also imagine that health of elderly people plays into that field when, the, when it's very hot. Together with the Ministry of Health, um, uh, which uh, has to develop a heat protection plan and together with other sectors, we want really to break out of the silos and to uh, ex develop a crisis management for this very comprehensive and multi-layer situation. And I think that's exactly what you were in ref what you referred to, especially against the background also of multiple crises, which very often cannot be delimited so um, exactly. What if um, this crisis is actually accompanied by another crisis? Next point, uh, communication was mentioned by everybody. Crisis communication in all uh, directions. Crisis communication uh, schemes, 
One message, many voices is very important to the inside towards the government, but also towards the crisis management and to the population because crisis resilience cannot be achieved without taking on board the population. Self-protection, how do you communicate this? We as German on had um, a hard time in, um, in uh, coping with that situation and in our historic uh, past and in the delimitation between peace and war, finding the right words so that you don't uh, produce anxiety among the population and still make them become more resilient at the personal level because the government will not be able to cover everything and to um, balance everything. And the third point is uh, trained crisis managers on the one hand, uh, but also the people um, we are mentioning, those so-called uh, professional crisis managers, they also have families, they have their own children. And there it's also important to think, how do we manage that those people will retain their capability to work in times of a crisis? Because I think nobody who may, is concerned about his family and the children is able to really um, uh, let's say, call up his uh, capabilities and skills and help others. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much uh, for your words. And um, as I mentioned before, we have 10 minutes left. And I would do, I would suggest that we just do a, like a last round. Um, so we have approximately two minutes per person, per expert. Um, yeah, I would be very interested in your um, summary, your last words. And maybe we start again with um, Ms. Bauer, if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, with pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I'll make five points, actually, in a very summary, summarized way, because I, that's what I get so much from, from the discussion. So the first one is the importance of investing in human capital, because in the end, a lot of what we've been discussing here, it's really investing into people uh, in, in, in a very comprehensive way in society. Second point is about inclusiveness. And I want to make a special point on uh, uh, gender empowerment and gender equality to ensure um, that women have are put in a position where they do have access to the labor market, they can contribute to their own development, they can contribute to the development of the country, and they put in a position where they can at the same time have a career and have children if they want to wish to, to really make their choices. So I would put this in gender empowerment. As a point about communication, I think that came very clearly from the different uh, speakers and, and it's um, obviously a, a cross-cutting challenge these days to be able to communicate in a way that is constructive and, and objective. And that brings me to the fourth point, which is evidence uh, and supporting countries, and now I'm referring to the, to the broader region, to uh, make sure that there are um, capacities in place and mechanisms in place to generate the evidence that we need to be able to fit into the, the, the policy decision. And, and finally, the um, importance of strengthening capacities for resilience for institution and, and, and outside institutions and population including through long life, uh, lifelong sorry, education, which I see as fundamental, as it was we need to invest from the early ages and, mm -hmm. and towards the uh, older population, because there's always a need uh, for, for education for that. So I'll stop with those five uh, points and, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, is someone from the experts uh, wants to be the next? I can. Okay, perfect. I can, thank I you. I can follow up on, on that, but I don't have so much <laughs> additional to say than, than what was uh, summarized very well by uh, Florence there. Uh, I think the, 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 these are, are, are key issues. I, I think w one thing that I'm getting out of this uh, um, uh, panel uh, discussion uh, and also listening to, uh, especially to Daniel. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, the, the the concern about uh, how we work towards sort of long-term long -term goals that can somehow supersede political uh, cycles, which are short. Uh, I think uh, uh, one issue in many countries that we have in our political systems is that politicians may not have long-term perspectives on as a first priority and and therefore if it is possible uh 
I, I guess every 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 nation state or every government should try to build in uh, structures that are somehow um, uh, safeguarding the the long term perspective of things. In the sense that you know, climate change is there, um, uh, aging is there, technological change is happening faster and faster, uh, cross political backgrounds and parties. How can you implement some kind of a long term um, let's say structures that try to take into account and let's not that is stable uh, addressing those issues and they are kind of independent of the political cycles. I think this is something that every country needs to address very carefully. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we have approximately five minutes, a little bit less maybe. Um, Mr. Onyango, you already unmuted, so yeah. you're maybe the Thank next. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I just want to add two things. Uh, one, also really uh, carrying the, the perspective from you know what we see in uh, uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, I think there is there's need to foster greater uh, collaboration between state and, 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 and non-state actors, especially where is these weak state capacity and uh, non-state actors actually do support a lot of the the public services and the reason why I say this is critical is because um to the extent that uh, at 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 times it seems that you know if you don't have that close collaboration then uh one uh, you can come up with very good uh, uh, solutions uh, or initiatives as non-state actors, but without the buy-in from the state, uh, then uh, that will not will not go very far. Uh, but also just uh, uh, acknowledging the role of, of 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 government as you know the the lead in 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 uh, policy making and then implementation is 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 critical. And so the non-state actors uh, shouldn't. Uh, you know they shouldn't be so, too divorced from from working together in government, but of course, uh, objectively. Um, so that's one one thing. The the second thing that I wanted to say is uh, just uh, again, this is uh, uh, in all this creating uh, intergenerational uh, 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 dialogue, and I, I think with some of the speakers have alluded to these differences. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we, what we are seeing, um, even in you know whether whether it's whether it's in the West, whether it's in the low and middle income countries in, in the the global South, uh, at times instead of creating that uh, dialogue and understanding uh, across the generations, we are pitting them against each other. And I'll give you a good example, for example, uh, coming from from Africa, where with the uh, generally high unemployment rates uh, you know the young people are being pitted against the older people for example and and, and they'd like them to 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 to, re, to 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 get out of work earlier so that they can get jobs rather than thinking that really across the life goals uh, you know people need to, to 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 have something to do in terms of 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 work and being able to generate income so um those two thank you Thank you very much for your words. And now the final words uh, for you, Mr. Mocha. Yeah, vielen Dank. Um, Thanks a lot. Well, you all together uh, strengthened my uh, wish and my uh, intention to further develop crisis management also in Germany. Everything which was said here is supporting my view uh, and uh, especially uh, what I take home is uh, knowledge transfer, education in general, but also in order to um, do away with mistrust against uh, state actors and uh, government action. That's a very important element of communication to the outside world. So in general, all your statements were very helpful to me. They will also support me in my further projects. Thank you for you. Uh, thank you very much. We are very much on time <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I also learned a lot from, from this panel and um, yeah, thank you everyone again for the nice communication now and also ahead. And I would say, and now we have a next panel starting in 15 minutes. So if ever you want to stay 
it's the same link. And if otherwise, I wish you a very nice end of this week and hope to see you again somewhere, somehow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks to all the others. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Nice meeting you.